Okay, here we are in Montpelier, standing in front of the State House. And we're gonna bring you a uh, special edition of the Pulse of Brattleboro. We've gone to Montpelier. We're gonna to talk to some of the uh, representatives and senators up here about some different issues. Okay, we are now sitting with the chair of the Economic Development Committee over here in the Senate, Senator Vincent Luzzi. From where's the, your real title? I know you're the Northeast Kingdom, but. Yeah, it's the Essex Orleans Senate District, which is the very northeast tip of the state and basically the northeast quadrant. And it's just one senator, right? Two. There's two of you? Yeah, myself and Bob Starr. Bobby, you guys are in the same district? Yes, we I are. I never knew that, even when I was here. Were you, was this a redistricting? Well, when you were here, you may have been in the house at that time. Oh, yeah, he was. That's right. That's right. Oh, because I always thought you were the only one, and that was one of the reasons why um, I was kind of surprised to hear about what you were thinking about doing your run for attorney general, because I was like, man, this guy, he's been up there for so long. I don't know if the people up there would even want you to do that. Well, I've gotten some resistance. You know, I do have a lot of seniority, and uh, they hate have. to lose me. Well, you have more than that, Senator. As somebody who sat on the House side, uh, and I was new, and it was very impressionable when I first got here, and to be honest, I didn't like you too much when I first got here, but part of that is a jealousy thing, too, because you know how it is. It's a seniority thing. You get a lot of seniority, you have a lot of more clout. You yeah. just do. Yeah. You also got to sit on the committee of conferences. That's huge, right. uh, and you were a big player. I got very lucky after a couple years serving that I got to sit on that with um, a special... Uh, man, in my opinion, in Representative Bob Wood. Great guy. He was. He was amazing. Um, you know, a little different than me, had a lot different views on things, but was straight shooter, and that's what I liked. And the thing I always admired and liked about you um, was, uh, you know, you work really hard mm -hmm. at what you do. In my well, thanks. Yeah. And um, I respected you because um, you didn't BS me. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, there was times you were a little under my crop, but... You know, you were straight too. So I, I like that though, Thank you know? You. Um, and being that you've sat here for so long, you know the way it works and you are pretty good at working both in and out <laughs> of this building. Well, you, you have to do that to be successful. So I was gonna start with what you're doing in the community, but since I'm heading off into the other thing, why do you wanna, why are you thinking about giving that up, Senator, and thinking about running for Attorney General? Well, I was asked last fall by the, uh, uh, some of the folks that work here. Uh, some folks are, are disappointed with the incumbent. And I said, okay, well, you can be disappointed, but why me? Why, you know, why do I come to the forefront in this discussion? And uh, basically what you said, you know, you've got a lot of experience. You know how government works. And why not take those 32 years of experience and apply it from a, a different perspective, you know, from the Office of the Attorney General. Um, I think I would have done things differently than have been done in some cases, uh, particularly the Vermont Yankee case. But it's a way to bring all of that energy and experience uh, to that office and helping to move forward, unified with the legislature and the executive branch. Um, oftentimes the Attorney General's office can help so long as the office is engaged in the work of the executive branch as well as the legislative branch. And I think I could do that. I know how this place works. It's like someone who's a watchmaker knows how the inner workings of a watch work. Well, as you've described, I've been here since I was a kid and I've grown up in the building, so I really understand the inner workings of the legislature. And having that experience and uh, training, knowledge, uh, would have made me a, a lawyer, I'd be able to I think parlay that into the public policy questions that confront the Attorney General's office from time to time. For example, Judge Murtha made a big deal out of the legislative record. Uh, having served here for 32 years, I realized that legislative committees will often talk about a lot of things, even though they understand that uh, some areas may not be strictly relevant to the discussion. Uh, so I think my approach to that case would have been much different than was uh, presented last fall, resulting in an adverse decision to the state. I think I could have parlayed the information from the legislative process, understanding it as I do, 
in a way that would have resulted in victory. Yeah, well, I think you definitely, yeah, I think that would bring a big uh, plus to that office, knowing how to operate outside of just there. I mean, because, you know, you do, your funding comes from there. I mean, um, you have very good connections with the people here that you need. Mm -hmm. Not all the time. Yeah, I mean, you know that. You are kind of separate over there, that's right. for sure. Sure. But, I mean, I just think that uh, when, you, when, when I first heard, uh, I remember uh, a couple years back saying if you ever were, were going to run for a statewide office to just let me know right. because that's how much I, you know, I mean, I don't go home talking about, you know, I actually go home on the radio and say, oh man, that damn senator again, mm -hmm. me and him had another battle, and, but we did a lot of good things too because one right. of the things that I really liked was when we were battling for the school money mm -hmm. and you guys had a, the vehicle that we we're going to use for chemotherapy or uh, dialysis machine. Right for the Northeast Kingdom, but we needed it, some extra money. And I remember we sat privately. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know what, take the money, let's get these people that, and then my chair was really mad. He said, we would've got it all if you would've, and we may have got it all, but I was really, you know, me, I like to try to be fair. Yeah. But uh, I, I just, I've just, um, you know, like I said, I think you have the experience, you know how to work it. Mm -hmm. I think losing you here, though, if you decide to do this, um, is, is something that I'm sure you're considering and weighing heavily. But saying that, I, th I also think the time is right. Mm -hmm. um, it, se it seems to me that uh, they're gonna, well, it looks like they're gonna have a run on the Democratic side anyway. Mm -hmm. um, and if Joey happened to, or not Joey, uh, if the Donovan kid happens mm -hmm. to win, then we'd mm -hmm. have two, if you decided, that'd be two fresh races. Mm -hmm. um, but I think you're well known throughout the state, mm -hmm. and I'd like to see, uh, personally, I'd like to see you give it a shot. And uh, we'll mm -hmm. see what happens. Well, thank you. My pleasure. Um, but now, back on to okay. what you're doing now, right here in the building. And you are the chair, like I said, of the Economic Development Committee. You're going to come down to Brattleboro. We were talking to Senator Galbraith just now. Uh, you guys played a, actually a, a bigger role than anybody's played in a while mm -hmm. to get some action around economic development down there if the plant was to have shut down. Right. It still might. We don't know. Uh, it's nice to see it's happening. Um, so, what's the plans when you go down to listen? What is? Well, last year we had a hearing in March, and uh, heard from a number of parties who uh, both interact with and, uh, to some extent, rely on the funding from Vermont Yankee. And our thought after the hearing was that we really need to plan uh, for the eventual closure of that plant. Now, when we were there in March of 2011, we obviously. Uh, operated on the official closure date of March 21. And uh, that has not come to pass for reasons we have briefly discussed. Uh, nonetheless, someday Vermont Yankee will close. And we really need to position the economy in a, it, it's such that it will not result in essentially Appalachia in that southeastern quadrant of the state. I think there are a number of initiatives that we can start to plan for. But before we start planning here in Montpelier, we wanted to give funding to the local community leaders to start the planning at the local level. Which you did do with some funding, and thank you very much. That, that money's already gone a long way. Well, thanks. We put that in the 2011 jobs bill, which we wrote in this yeah. committee. In fact, this committee wrote the 2009, the 2010, and the 2011 jobs bill. So we put a little money aside for Wyndham County and uh, on Friday, we're going to hear from uh, Stephen Morris and the committee that worked uh, over the past 12 mm -hmm. months. And we're hoping to uh, see what recommendations they have. Another thing that we're looking at is some, some, some sustainable funding for economic development activities in that part of the state. Um, as Senator Galbraith has reminded our committee often, it's the state's de decision to close Vermont Yankee. Uh, regardless of what you think of Vermont Yankee, people need to live in Wyndham County. Mm -hmm. So let's be uh, thoughtful and uh, artful about it and see if we can put together an economic business plan that transitions. Uh, as I said, it's going to close sooner or later. It may be sooner than Entergy hopes. It may be later than some anti-Vermont Yankee folks hope. So um, I just want to make sure that we've done all that we can, given our limited resources. You know, we can't mm -hmm. dump millions into the region given all the other demands, but nonetheless. Well, you come from a region that has its own demands. That's right. And, uh, and have gone through this yourself. I mean, the Ethan Allen plant up there 
uh, was huge. I don't know what what is that doing now, as a matter well, of fact. Well, uh, the Ethan uh, the Ethan Allen address. had three plants in the Northeast Kingdom: two in Essex County and one in Orleans County. No. The one in Island Pond in Essex County closed completely. The one in Beecher Falls, which is the very northeast tip of the state, mm -hmm. has substantially curtailed operations down from a high of maybe 200 to 250 employees down to about 35 or 40. Mm -hmm. But the Orleans plant continues to operate. And, and, and I would have to say you played a big role in probably that. That's right. Containing we've, still this committee and yourself. We've worked hard to ensure that Ethan Allen stays here. Now they have operations mm -hmm. uh, uh, in other countries. They're uh, most recently making chairs in Honduras. Yeah, I see and, that's the problem. And we've done what we can on, a, on, on property taxes, on worker compensation, on energy efficiency for the plant to ensure that Vermont remains a foothold for the company. After all, it's named after Ethan Allen. Famous. And yeah. I think that, as much as anything, has played a role in the company staying here. It's headquartered in uh, Connecticut, and uh, it has stockholders from around the country, if not the world. And of course, stockholders want to see return on investment. Yeah. Uh, so we've you know, navigated those waters, balanced uh, the competing needs, and done what we can. But the company, on balance, is happy with what we've done. So Ethan Allen remains in, some, in a big presence in Orleans County. On the other hand, uh, with Wyndham County, I know that there were some significant closures in your area over the last you know, 15 or 20 years. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to understand that the last largest employer, uh, Vermont Yankee, is going to be leaving that area. And we need to position the, the economy such that it is prepared to transition. I'm committed to that. Senator Galbraith's committed to that, uh, as is the rest of the Wyndham delegation. You know, we have Senator right. White in the Senate and members of the House. I think everyone, everybody wants to pull in the same direction. Yeah. And uh, as the chairman of the committee, even though I'm not from Wyndham County, I've uh, obviously shared similarities. My, my district is considered uh, the forgotten part of the mm -hmm. state. Your area might feel somewhat the same. Mm -hmm. So I, I know where the folks in Wyndham County are coming from, and uh, I'm gonna make sure that state resources are allocated to the extent we can afford to do so to uh, make sure that we continue to move forward on, on the economic front. Now, another thing you guys are working on in this committee, and I you know, I, I don't think it's gonna be successful or not, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but, uh, and you were a big player in the dams, that's another reason why, you know, uh, we had a Republican governor, you are a Republican, um, but you stood up really strong because you thought the dams was a, was a good move for the state to buy. I agree with you. Now we have another opportunity with the transmission lines. I know you're a big part of that. Um, how are we doing? Well, uh, just to make clear, Velco is the state's only significant transmission grid. Yep. Every Vermont electric ratepayer relies on that grid. So you talk about a monopoly. Uh, it is the only game in town. When the I pay rent on my poles, even you pay you get your part bill, of, you're paying uh, like twelve cents for pole rent. That's right. Part of your fee, part of your rate includes the cost of transmission. Mm -hmm. And my position is, when the initial press release first came out that Green Mountain Power was going to buy Central Vermont Public Service, there was not even uh, a footnote mention of Velco. I intuitively knew and later confirmed that controlling Velco is a significant goal of Gas Metro. Gas Metro uh, has a, a substantial amount of hydroelectric generation capacity and it's building that capacity. Uh, at the present time, the economy is somewhat in the doldrums. We're still struggling. There's a lot of electricity out there right now, but as the economy picks up, which it invariably will in the next four to seven years, there is going to be increased demand for electricity in New England, New York, Long Island, and Gas Metro is positioning itself to be able to sell electricity from Quebec, Labrador, Churchill Falls, that whole region, uh, to southern New England where the real load or demand is. Yeah, dollars. <laughs> uh, my concern is that Vermont will become a byway for the cash going north and the electricity going south with no real significant benefit for Vermont. So I intervened in the case pending at the Public Service Board. 
And uh, one of the things I argued for is that Velco become what's known as a B, as a boy corporation, a benefit corporation, which would not only look at corporate profit as the bottom line and the only real driving factor in making decisions, but rather to look at what benefits come to society from the operation of this company. It's a law we passed and became effective in uh, 2011. And uh, I believe that as a benefit corporation, we would take into consideration things like the economy, impact on the environment when you build these relatively large transmission lines and additional transmission lines. Now, another thing a lot of folks know is that Gas Metro also owns Vermont Gas, which provides natural gas to uh, Northwest and uh, Chittenden County. It's going to be moving down to Addison County and then to Rutland County. One of the concerns I have is that the uh, decisions by Gas Metro to expand its service happens in a way that does not further degrade the environment uh, because uh, clearly Gas Metro has certain rights of way. Many of them were obtained through a very controversial process mm -hmm. known as eminent domain. Mm -hmm. And uh, I want to ensure that we have Vermonters sitting at the board room table when these decisions are made so that it's not all about how much is Gas Metro going to make on this project, but rather what's going to be the benefit and the detriments to Vermonters. And uh, so I played an active role in that regard. I've been the flying ointment, uh, if you will, to some. Uh, legislatively, I propose legislation to allow the state to acquire an ownership interest in Belco so that as an owner you can play, mm -hmm. you can be a party to those decisions. And uh, as you know from working here as a, a representative, this legislature is by and large run by the lobbyists. Uh, Velco, Green Mountain Power, Central Vermont Public Service on any day have 13 to 14 lobbyists in the building. So anytime you propose something which goes against the corporate interests of Gas Metro or Green Mountain Power mm -hmm. or Central Vermont at the present time, or Velco, which also has lobbyists, uh, all of these reasons are manufactured about why it's such a bad idea. So one of the arguments they threw at us, the lobbyists for these corporations, was that, well, Velco's a risky investment. Why would you want to invest in a company like Velco? If you read the bond prospectus for Velco, it's probably as safe an investment as you could buy and invest in. And so our position has been that uh, Vermont should have uh, an ownership interest. Not only do you share in the profits, but you also have a a significant role in making decisions about should we build this additional transmission line? If so, where should it go? What environmental protection should be in place? Of significance is that two of the lines that I've seen already drawn conceptually would build additional transmission cap capacity through Vermont with none of the electricity serving Vermonters. Yeah. So we cannot allow that. Well, that's, I know it's going to happen. That's, but that's a concern that I have. If you were Attorney General, is there any steps you could take as Attorney General on this, or you need that legislative, you need the law, you need the law in place well, first, first, right? I mean, well, there's nothing you can do as an Attorney General. Well, the Attorney the General, there is a statute that allows the Attorney General to represent the public interest. Uh, so clearly, I would be advocating both at the board level and at the legislative level uh, th these concerns. And I think as Attorney General, it gives you uh, a a position of, uh, of uh, objectivity where you come in and you say, look, we've looked at these issues, we've studied them independent of the legislature, and, uh, and, and then offer opinions and, and solutions. So I think I would, you know, the current attorney general has been MIA, missing in action on this. You know, it's, uh, just I haven't heard him on this, and I've been disappointed in, uh, in him on uh, several okay, campaign finance is another one for me personally. Um, and uh, of course the BY thing, and there's some other ones. But he did good, in, uh, some good work on a few things too. We had the police problem down there in Brattleboro that he was very hands on with and things like that. So, yeah. you know, but I just think that, you know, he's been here a long time. I'll tell you something else, Vince, I, or Senator, I, I'm not really sure. I, I, I'm glad you were paying attention because, um, you know, that whole Velcro thing, I mean, that was going through like uh, there was nothing, and all of a sudden, yeah. bang. And um, before I could even grasp it and right. start learning about it, it was almost already gone. Well, it was uh, the greases, uh, the skids were greased. Yeah. And uh, 
I sort of, when I filed my various uh, documents with the board, it was essentially arguing that uh, we need to take a step back and look at the impact of uh, Velco ownership uh, on ratepayers, on mm -hmm. environmental issues. So I've, I've played the best possible role that I could as essentially a one-man person. Uh, there was no uh, real backup. Come on, you like that. Well, I like it, but it's a little. It's nice to have people behind you, though. It's a little I mean, overwhelming. You know, yeah, yeah. It's uh, you be the lead guy, but it's nice to have some people stand right. behind you, going, "Yeah, we're with them." Right. Yeah. And and most and, and mo most Vermonters, which is represented in the legislature, don't have an active interest in energy issues. Uh, when I was trying to buy and the boy, we really ought to choose them out. Well, when I was you trying still to got your wind, right? That's right. I have a wind turbine at my house. But when I was trying to buy the hydro dams in 2002 and 2003, yeah, I, with you. I had a very difficult time getting the average person interested. Likewise, in 2011 and 2012, I've had a very difficult time getting people interested in this subject. It may be different in Wyndham County because yeah, we there. are a little different. Down well, you're more sensitized to energy issues because that the dams were huge down there. They were really big down there. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and, and that's something you can't get back now, and shh, boy, and what happened right after that, you know, they kept telling us we couldn't afford it, we couldn't afford it. As soon as they bought it, TransCanada bought it, the value went sky high, right. you know. Well, listen, um, before we go, a couple minutes maybe, anything else going on in the committee we ought to hear about? Well, we're going to come down and we're going to honor uh, some folks there, the two local radio stations that provided uh, some assistance during... Tropical Storm Irene, and also Senator Robert Gannett, with whom I served when I started. Remember, I started. I believe he's in his 90s. He's 94, and I, I first was elected in 1980, the same night as Ronald Reagan. 80. Now, are you the, are you the longest serving member in this? I'm not the longest now? serving, but Doyle still he, Senator yeah. Doyle is ahead of me. He started in 1960. He got elected. 80, in, 68, right? He got elected in 68 with Dean Davis. <coughs> and started in January of 69. I was elected. I forget in, about him sometimes. I was elected in uh, November 1980, same night as Ronald Reagan, oh, right. and wow. started in January 1981. At the time I started, I was the youngest state senator in Vermont history at 27. I had just turned 27, my birthday's in September. So I've been here, as I said, a, a very long time, and I've really grown up in the building. And I think, as you can recall from your days here, uh, whether I'm an R or a D, I happen to be both. I get elected. Yeah, as a I, I always say you should Democrat. be an independent. And matter of yeah. fact, when we talked, I said, geez, I just talk about running as an independent. Right. But you, you know, where you represent and stuff, the R is, is good. And you are, you're totally in. Well, my area is more independent person. than anything else. Yeah, and, and they know you. <laughs> and they know me. And, and it, one, of the, one of the issues that you and others have brought to my attention as well, don't go to Wyndham County, save your gas money because they're well, not. Well, I didn't tell you that. I see. Others, others have said. And, I think you'll do better than you think. Well, it's nice to hear that, but I really have been an independent here at the State House. I've worked with both sides. Uh, here I am, chairman of a, a fairly significant committee as a, uh, I'm an RD. For a long time, and we're chair of the Institutions right. Committee for a long time. That's right. And, um, and I've, I've played it, you know, down the middle. Uh, yeah. I call them as I see them. I don't, I'm not bound by any philosophy, clearly not any of the philosophy you hear about Washington. But it's been a pleasure. I've met some of the greatest people in Vermont. Uh, I've learned well, from them. Well, you work with an awful lot of pe people, too, really. So I'm looking forward to spending Friday in uh, Brattleboro. Then we're going to Wilmington. We're going to tour Tri Park oh. uh, because of the damage there from the storm. And uh, look forward to seeing you there. Yeah, well, hopefully I'll make it. Depends on my work schedule. Uh, listen, thanks for your time. Thank you very much, Carol. Really appreciate Carole. it. You keep welcome, back, welcome back to the State House. Great being here. Hey. hey! This door weighs like a hundred pounds. Thank you. Just keep going. I'll hold the door since I got it. I almost asked you if Daryl was here still. You were still hanging out up here. I was. I was just kind of visiting. Good. Good. All right, so we hope you enjoyed this uh, version of the Pulse. We just came up here to talk about a couple things with some of our local uh, represent or senators and a few of the Chittenden County senators. And uh, the transmission lines are pretty important, in my opinion, folks. And, and um, along with the economic development plan, 
for the closing of VY. So that's why we kind of talked to the senators uh, and um, the senators anyway that were in the Economic Development Committee. And um, stay tuned. We hope to come back to Montpelier again with another special edition of The Pulse and bring you up to date on some more issues. Thank you.